Good morning. My name is Abhishek Malani and I'm a senior at Glastonbury High School. This year, I'm proud to serve as the president of the 2017 World Affairs Council Model United Nations. With over 1,000 students coming from more than 35 different schools across the, uh, across the state, the student-run conference in Hartford has been a hub of creativity, innovation, and most of all, diplomacy. This year, I'll be chairing a new committee, a Committee on Cybersecurity, which is tasked with developing a digital Geneva Convention. This topic couldn't be more relevant with the recent Equifax hacks and the WannaCry attacks. And so I'm honored to hear from Arthur House, Connecticut's Chief Cybersecurity Risk Officer. And now I want to introduce to the stage Major General Michael Jones, who will be moderating this next panel, The Escalating Threat of Cyber Warfare. Now, as a senior officer, General Jones was extensively involved in cyber, cyber operations at a both tactical and strategic level. He served in a variety of command and staff positions, including at the U.S. Central Command. And, for, and we're here today with General, Michael, uh, with General Michael Jones because he has extensive knowledge and experience of cybersecurity on both a defensive and offensive level, which is one of the few people who has both defensive and offensive experience. And so now, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Major General Michael right, Jones. Okay. Right, great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Uh, well, why don't you sit in the sure. center seat? Uh, well, thank you. Kind introduction. And uh, first of all, thank, thank you all. Thanks to uh, uh, local chapter MOA. Uh, which is a, is a lifetime member of MOA. I have to tell you that they are a great organization to keep national security issues uh, kind of on the forefront and also to make sure that we have uh, the capability and readiness in the U.S. Armed Forces to deal with the challenges that the country has. And of course, to the, uh, thank the World Affairs Council uh, of Connecticut. That, what a great organization to put on programs like this. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, the fourth time I've participated in the last decade in a uh, Connecticut WAC uh, event. And I have to tell you, uh, the, uh, the programming is terrific. Uh, the folks who are part of, of the, uh, the World Affairs Council are extremely knowledgeable, and it's a pleasure to participate every time I get a chance to do it. So thank you all for your interest in this. Um, uh, today we're going to talk about the, uh, the cyber uh, threat uh, in the world that has emerged. And I think in order to, to start considering this topic, you have to think historically. And I was glad to hear the first panel start off with the, with the history of things, because it's so important. And it's when you think about the internet, uh, trace it back to its origins. It, you know, it started as a DARPA net amongst a group of people who had uh, great mutual interests. They had common values and a great deal of trust. Uh, academics and military folks who were geographically dispersed uh, but needed to exchange a lot of information. And so that's the origins, and when you look at the architecture of how it was built, uh, it's built in that framework. And, they, and the originators had no idea how this thing would grow into the internet that we have today, where virtually all non-person-to-person -person communication that goes on in our planet uh, is occurring over this thing called the internet. Uh, and we were very dependent on it in a way where not only uh, uh, for, our, for how we do our lives, but in some cases our livelihoods are dependent on this thing called the Internet. And so in this world uh, that has changed significantly, we unfortunately have some folks out there who are using this domain uh, for nefarious purposes, uh, something that probably the originators never imagined could happen. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, that's why we're having this panel today. Uh, and we're very lucky uh, to be joined uh, by, by one of the premier experts in, in this domain. Uh, Art House, as you all know, is the, the chief of cyber uh, risk for the state of Connecticut. Uh, but he has a long uh, history of, of many important positions that give him insights into this area. Obviously, he was, uh, prior to that, the head of the Public Utilities uh, Commission here in in, uh, in the state, uh, where that is a very important aspect of the, the utility world. Uh, prior to that, he served both uh, in government uh, with the uh, uh, Director of National Intelligence, uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, 
uh, also the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and of course he's also had uh, many senior positions in the private sector as well. Uh, and oh, by the way, he has a PhD from the Fletcher School, uh, has taught graduate courses at a number of universities, and is your typical uh, Connecticut underachiever from what I can tell. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, let's, uh, what I'd like to do is start off, uh, have, have Art talk to us a little bit about this domain and some of the implications uh, when it comes to the, uh, the national security, even the global st uh, strategic security uh, arena. Uh, I'll have a couple questions for him, and then I know you all are going to have some questions for him as well, uh, and we'll just have a, kind of a dialogue about this. So, Art. Thanks. Over to General Mike, you set the scene perfectly. That's exactly what it was. The internet was set up by trusting individuals. Um, and I'd like to level set by just getting some facts out there and then having a, turning this from a monologue into a dialogue. Uh, first of all, the sponsors, thanks for making this possible. This is a great event. Um, this is what the World Affairs Council was meant to do, to bring together for interested people in the region a forum on international affairs. They do it very well. Uh, if you're not a member, you should be. Check, check it out. It's, it's a lot of fun. They have great programs. Um, last, uh, you know, we started here, Colonel. You led us in the Pledge of Allegiance. It reminded me of my days of the Combat Support Agency and in the intelligence community where we practically start a coffee break with marching in the flags and saluting and so on, and we took it very seriously. Um, and when I went up to the Hill to, uh, for congressional testimony, the Congressman senators would almost always start by saying, thank you for your service. Now, I carry a common access card from the Defense Department, and uh, I, on behalf of the 100,000 people in the intelligence community that we were, we were representing, I, I appreciated the thanks, but you know, I never went in harm's way. I uh, never sailed or marched or flew into the danger and gave blood. And I have a, a lot of respect for the armed forces, and a lot of you are here today, so hats off to you. Um, Last night, General Casey did a brief straw poll in an event and said, what are the greatest dangers we're facing? And cyber won hands down. Uh, it is scary. It is frightening. And it is not a fairy tale that ends with the prince and princess uh, riding off to, into the sunset and living happily ever after. It's very troubling. But because it is, we have to understand it. We have to talk about it and understand what the threats are and what we can do about it. Um, so for a level set, just throw out a few facts. One is that cyber is a weapon. Um, it, is, it can attack both military and civilian um, targets. It can be used alone or it can be used as part of another military operation. Secondly, cyber enables asymmetric warfare. Very simply, what that means is that like guerrilla warfare and terrorism, a weaker country um, a weaker opponent of a country or non-country can inflict considerable damage on the more powerful opponent. Um, third point is offense is much easier than defense. A country's domestic critical infrastructure is exposed. It is far easier, much, much easier to, to launch an attack than to defend against one. The United States is a target. We're not used to that. Growing up in the United States since World War II, wars, well, wars were always over there. We sent our armed forces. We, the warfare, the military conflicts were not directed so much against the United States. That changed with 9-11. Um, and there's relatively little theory about what the cyber does as a threat to the United States. Joe and I, Professor Joe and I up at Harvard has given some, some discussion, some attention to cyber warfare. He makes a few points. One, a very low price of entry. Just about anybody can get into this game. Secondly, it has much greater anonymity than other forms of warfare. And third, the asymmetrics of vulnerability, which I just discussed. Now, Nye calls it a, quote, a new and volatile man-made environment that reduces some of the power differentials among actors. And, a, quote, the largest powers are likely, uh, are unlikely to be able to dominate this domain as they have in others like land, sea, air, space. In China, there has been some strategic thought given to cyber warfare, cybersecurity. Two uh, People's Liberation Army colonels, senior colonels, um, political officers, Kiao Yang and Wang Xingxua, in 1999 wrote a book which is entitled Unrestricted Warfare, and it's become part of the lodestone of Chinese thinking about cybersecurity and cyber warfare. And they made the point that war is no longer simply about using armed forces to compel the enemy to submit to one's will. And the 
classic Clausewitz sense that you veterans all know so well. Uh, conceding back in 1999 that China would lose a conventional war against the United States, the authors stated um, that um, China could win if there were a domestic disruption in the United States, one that focused on our critical infrastructure. And if our military forces had to be preoccupied with dealing with serious critical infrastructure disruption, they could beat us in a conventional war. And they know that today as well. They also discussed not just critical infrastructure, but financial markets, traffic, air, highways, and trains, and so forth, and also paralyzing communications in the mass media. They also noted, this is a strong point, that strong countries make the rules while the rising ones break them. Uh, the, so, I mean, and that, those are two sources of critical th theoretical thinking about cyber warfare. Uh, when we talk about it, there are roughly three groups that can, can engage in it. I'm, I know I'm simplifying here, but one is nation states. The second is terrorist groups or, or rogue actors. And the third are the cyber mercenaries. A lot of them live in Eastern Europe. Really smart, savvy people who can take a computer and wreak enormous damage, and they are out for hire. And they have been hired by a number of countries. Why develop your own if you can bring somebody down for $100,000 and make him or her very comfortable and use their, their technology and their knowledge. You don't have to invent it yourself. There are four nation states we especially worry about, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. But uh, the latest count by people who know about this is that 108 countries have uh, dedicated cyber attack units, 108. Um, Rogue actors, who are they? Well, ISIS, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, cyber posses, but they're also very sophisticated crime syndicates. Uh, they're terrorist groups, all of which have or seek to have access to cyber warfare. Um, and the third are those cyber mercenaries I referred to. So nation states, rogue actors, and these cyber mercenaries who are up for hire. What, you know, we've, we've started to see warfare. It, it has taken place. One of the marking points was in 2005, the uh, U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff concluded that a cyber attack could potentially have the same effect on the United States or elsewhere as weapons of mass destruction. 2009, the British Joint Intelligence Committee announced uh, a finding that chi China's cyber espionage was becoming, quote, very sophisticated and mature and could enable China to, quote, shut down critical services, including power, food, and water supplies in the Western nations. So where are we currently? Well, one of the problems is that a prolonged war amongst major powers that did not go nuclear uh, could be destructive and inconclusive for a while, in which case one side might feel required to inflict steep domestic costs. Uh, and gain a non-direct military advantage through cyber warfare, a cyber attack, which would in, could inflict steep costs and produce serious political effects. Um, just three days ago, um, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Joe Dunford, uh, a good Fletcher graduate, Michael, by the way, uh, he uh, told the Senate Armed Services Committee that Russia is the most significant threat in cyberspace today with, quote, potentially existential threat to the United States being posed and the most advanced capabilities. They effectively, quote, combine cyber capability with political influence operations, which you have seen in our media in the last several months. Uh, economic coercion, uh, information operations, electronic warfare, and even military posture. Uh, now, Two days ago, um, Bill Evanina, who is the head of the National Counterterrorism Center, this was, this was Thursday, um, made a quote saying, China is our number one adversary with respect to economic um, espionage and cyber activity. So if you, that's overgeneralization because they overlap. But Russia as the existential military threat, China as the, as the greater economic threat, uh, some estimate that China is responsible for 41% of all cyber attacks in the world. Um, it's the largest transfer of wealth in the history of the world, the stealing of intellectual property. The Chinese have stolen the plans for the F-15, the Black Hawk helicopter, the Aegis anti-ballistic missile systems, and several others. Our most sophisticated military systems that you veterans used 
the, the Chinese have effectively stolen them. So it's not one of these, gee, what's going on here? Should I take it seriously? Of course you take it seriously. Um, total manpower in China is about 180,000 cybersecurity uh, spies or warriors. And a large majority of those are electrical engineers. I mean, just think what 180,000 people focused on trying to penetrate the Pentagon and our intelligence services are. Just one unit, it's a famous unit, PL, unit PLA, People's Liberation Army Unit 61398. It's on Datong Road in Shanghai. It's, a, it's their headquarters, 12 stories, 130,000 uh, square feet. Uh, and in there, they direct this 180,000 network, uh, which is a very serious national security threat. Okay, enough of the theory, enough of the capabilities. Let's talk about a couple of examples of actual use of cyber warfare and lessons learned. The very first one probably was in Estonia in 2007. Estonia post-Berlin Wall is starting to feel uh, like joining more with the West. It uh, joins the European Economic Community. It joins NATO. It accepts the Euro as its currency. Uh, and it's kind of feeling like other Scandinavian countries, which is in effect what it is. Right in the middle of Tallinn it was a, a monument to the Great Patriotic War. Um, and it was built by the Russians. And the Estonians decided that, you know, fine, all that, but right in the middle of our capital city, this thing, let's move it out to a military cemetery in the outskirts of town where it belongs. The Russians said, do not dare do that. Don't even think about it. 17% um, of Estonia is, of Rus is Russian ethnically and culturally. So they did. They moved it out to a military cemetery. The response was DDoS, what, distributed denial of service attack uh, that overwhelmed the news media, the banking system, the education system, the communication system, the military. Uh, and Estonia has had to completely rebuild its cybersecurity um, infrastructure. Uh, I was there in April uh, to talk about Connecticut. They're interested in Connecticut cybersecurity strategy, which is among the most advanced of all states. They looked at it and said, you know, it's very similar to what we did. I said, great, could I see yours too? <laughs> oh no, that's classified. <laughs> but you're on the right track. Today, Estonia is one of the most advanced countries in the world in cybersecurity defense. Why? Because they were attacked, they had to rebuild it. You don't have to tell an Estonian that cyber is a weapon. They know, they've recovered, and they take cybersecurity strategy as part of their daily life. Georgia, in 2008, there was a very complex cybersecurity attack. It was part of a conventional invasion, which ended up uh, with Russia, I put this word in quote, liberating the people of Abkhazia and South Ossetia and the creation of independent states um, that only Russia recognizes, but uh, for the Russians, they are independent states. Um, the cyber dimension meant taking over radio, television, neutralizing them, taking over the uh, website of President Sash Kavili. And then they attacked the uh, Baku Tbilisi Ceylon pipeline, causing it to explode. Um, the National Bank of Georgia website was defaced. So they basically they're blinded, and they start sending in pulses. We're coming from the east, we're coming from the west, we're coming from here, there, uh, to the military who had to deploy to all of these threats, not knowing what's real. And the Russians just walked in and uh, took the took the territory they wanted to seize. Um, Ukraine. Uh, the State Department has set up a task force to help the Ukrainians build a strategy of cybersecurity defense. They, they invited Connecticut, because we're out in front on this, to be part of that. I've been, I was there in December, met with them again in Estonia in, in April, and we just met two weeks ago. Now, you don't have to tell the Ukrainian that cyber is a weapon. They're getting artillery shells lobbed at them. They're having disinformation thrown at them all the time. It's not just a weapon. It's one that's being used against them in their daily lives. They're completely familiar with it. Uh, in December of 2016, everybody knows a quarter of a million people lost electricity. It was, um, it was a spear phishing attack. Shut it down, and they came back up. The intention was two things, to cause insecurity, but also to cause the Ukrainians to doubt their own government. What good is my government if I see it as potentially corrupt and it can't even guarantee the use of electricity, causes dissent, causes just that, it causes, causes lack of confidence in the government. They did it again a year later, December of 2016. Just as a reminder, we're still here. We can do this whenever we want to. 
in June of 2017, there was a new and powerful system called Crash Override, which was used to compromise several Ukrainian um, businesses and utilities. I, I talked to the head of the, my, my, basically my counterpart in Connecticut in Ukraine, met with him two weeks ago, and he said, it's absolutely frightening. He said, all the utilities that had done all the right things and had defenses up and everything were devastated as equally as those who'd done nothing. In other words, the ability to create a brand new malware that overcomes all defenses. It's very, very sobering. You got to defend yourself, but even if you do, the Russians, the message they were sending is it doesn't matter. We can come in here whenever we damn well please. Um, the United States has used it a few times. We've heard about Stuxnet in North Korea. We tried to, we went after the centrifuges in, in Iran uh, in the summer of 2010 to disable them, cause them to spin out of control. Uh, we've used it in operations against ISIS and other terrorist groups. Um, we've, the media has reported efforts to uh, compromise the launching of missiles in North Korea. The lesson is that today, um, cyber is as integral to warfare as land, air, sea, and space. Uh, when we reconvene here in another 10 years and look back, there'll probably be people in the audience who served in a new branch of the armed forces called the cyber force. Um, critical infrastructure and critical management, emergency management in the United States. Three brief points. One, the United States and other Western countries are seriously vulnerable to new forms of warfare, possibly from nation states or, or rogue actors. It's a vulnerability which is simple to execute. Some of our utilities right now are penetrated and another country could pull the trigger when they wanted to. Secondly, cyber attacks are possible in several forms. We've heard about the d distributed denial of services, compromise of critical infrastructure, use of an electromagnetic pulse. There are all kinds of ways of getting in and inflicting damage. Uh, domestically, affecting the economy. We have seen all the compromises in businesses, banks, communications, even our intelligence operations, military operations in the United States have been penetrated. Uh, this is broad, this is, this is very broad. Um, the, uh, well, it's an urgent need to critical infrastructure, to have strategies and to take action plans. Uh, we can I could have one. Uh, we set one up uh, under the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority. This was a strategy. Governor said, go ahead and do it. When I left the, the world of intelligence and spying, uh, they said, you know, the states are our vulnerability. And these state regulatory agencies, they usually don't focus on this because they have electricity, water, uh, natural gas, telecommunications, law, uh, engineering, finance. They got their hands full. And boy, they do. And then, you know, you say, now you've got to take on cybersecurity. Well, we did in Connecticut. And we set up a strategy and then an action plan. And this year, we have just completed the review of Connecticut's utilities. They have cooperated with state authorities. They have strategies of their own. They've acted on them. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, the attitude of Connecticut's utilities has been extremely positive. Uh, there's an urgent need to have plans uh, and to prepare for response and recovery. Should there be a cyber attack, it would not be like an ice storm or a hurricane where we go without power for a week or something like that. Uh, the consequences of that are severe. We can talk about it more if you'd like to, but it gets after the water supply. It would probably involve the out-migration of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, it's, a, it's a new threat that we, we need to prepare for. Um, so domestic defense, is going to be an equal part of our national security in a way that it has not been up to this point. General Mike, I hope I've level set. I hope I've, I hope I've bothered some people and, and, <laughs> and caused some attention. Right. Uh, let me come back and sit yeah, down please, with you. Please uh, you come back uh, and sit. Uh, and what we do, I, I have a, do have a couple questions I want to ask, ask Art, and, uh, and then we'll get to some audience questions and answers. So, so let me start with, first of all, uh, I want to say up front, um, we're not going to go into a lot of details about capability that the United States has. Uh, if there's somebody from the New York Times here who wants to elaborate on that later, that, that's fine. But the, uh, but the bottom line is I think what uh, you can and should know is the United States uh, does have uh, a significant offensive capability uh, that could uh, make life very miserable for any potential adversary. Uh, and just using that as the premise, 
the, the question I, I have for you, Art, is that with this huge destructive power that we have, uh, this is not new to us in terms of dealing with a weapon that has huge destructive power and how do we live in a world where we can prevent using it. We've done that with nuclear weapons uh, for a good, good part of almost 70 years and the previous panel talked about that a lot. So, so my question to you is, you know, given the experience that we've had keeping the lid on nuclear conflict, uh, can there be a, a policy or a strategy of mutually assured destruction or something mm. like that uh, mm. that can keep us out of this uh, very consequential uh, cyber conflict, given the consequences, the consequences you could have? Yeah. Well, that's a damn good question. I guess my, my answer is kind of yes and no. Um, it's very hard to attribute this stuff. When you look at a cyber attack, it came from Johannesburg. And then when you take it apart, no, it really came from Rio de Janeiro. And then you start doing the forensics, which takes a long time, and you find out it came from Brooklyn. Well, what happened here? I mean, you can do attribution, but it's extremely difficult, and it takes a long time. Uh, there are serious reasons why I think China and Russia right now don't want to risk a war with the United States right now. China has, holds over a trillion dollars of U.S. bonds. Do you really want the United States to go to war with the United States and damage our economy? Russians, I think, are, uh, they want to do all kinds of terrible things to mess us up. I don't think they want an all-out war with us right now. Uh, they could, but uh, so in that sense, there's a parallel to, to uh, mutually assured destruction. Um, but they're no in a couple cases. Um, if war were to begin, there would be an asymmetric advantage to both China and Russia because we are far more dependent on the computer, the digital world. It affects absolutely everything we do. That is not the case in China, Russia, and a whole bunch of other countries. So it doesn't apply, above, above all, it certainly does not apply directly, as directly to Iran or to Korea or to any one of the rogue uh, states. Suppose you took an ISIS uh, or any one of those other organizations and they had 50, 000, 50 million bucks. And they went to Eastern Europe and hired a bunch of experts and came down and said, let's do it. Uh, what do they have to lose? So I think against the major nation states, the theory of mutually assured destruction is very, very relevant. Against some of the rogue actors, it is not. The other thing that sort of frightens me is, that, is, the, is the vulnerability of our own country. Uh, we have, as, as you said, General, a, a very sophisticated offensive capability. It comes under Admiral Mike Rogers, the National Security, National Security Agency. The commander of that is, uh, is Admiral T.J. White. He is the man who goes to war using cyber warfare and defends the United States. When he saw that Connecticut had both a strategy and an action plan, he invited me down there. I went down there in July, and unlike the head of the Navy is not worried, is, is in charge of preventing a naval invasion in the United States. It's not likely to happen. And the head of the Army, in, in addition to the offensive capabilities, is also in charge of preventing an invasion in the United States. Well, we don't worry very much about an invasion landing in New London. And, and, and we, the head of the cybersecurity force is in charge of defending the United States, and he is attacked every single hour. And he makes the point that the United States is under attack. And one of the weakest parts are the states which have the critical infrastructure, which is why part of our defense, that's why states now have a role in our national defense. We have to recognize it, we have to prepare for it, and we have to understand how do we recover from it? What do we do? So, and that, and, and you know, that's not mutually assured destruction. So I think it cuts both ways, and I, I, I like the question. Well, I, th I think uh, that leads me to, to my next uh, question for you, and this was maybe a little difficult. The, uh, you know, when we talk about cyber attack, we, we talk about it in ter often in terms of technical attack uh, and, and having had, uh, you know, the most attack network yeah. in the world at one time, uh, you know, I, it, we're attacks number in the thousands of days uh, per day, you know, it's certainly a concern that we have to protect against. But, but beyond that, uh, there's this new uh, use of this domain that goes beyond the technical aspect, and that's the informational aspect. Uh, you've already alluded to the Russian uh, investigation that's going on in terms of activities that were done uh, in our national elections this last time. You've, we've talked about how they've used that information domain 
uh, in a number of the countries that they've had forays into. Uh, and so there's this informational piece of the manipulation, distortion, uh, and use of this domain in order to get outcomes, in some cases nefarious outcomes, that, um, that are used in the informational aspect. So the first question is a two-part uh, question. The first question is, can we defend against that in this domain, uh, given the potential it has for harm? Uh, and the second part of the question is, if we can, should we? And if, if the answer is, yes, we should, how do we balance that against our value about freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and protecting uh, people's rights in that area? Yeah. The, can we? Of course we can. Uh, we also could be completely safe from any form of disruption. We could have turned into East Germany uh, and very chance of domestic disruption of any kind. We, are not, we didn't want to turn into a police state, and we didn't. Could we? Yeah, it would, it would mean shutting down the internet. It would mean censorship of newspapers. It would mean doing all kinds of things that are just completely un, unacceptable in the American culture and complete violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution. Um, I think the only answer, so in effect I'm saying no. Uh, as long as you can put just about anything you want in a newspaper on the air over the internet, the new challenge is that you have to decide what's real and what's not real. Now you have both fake and unfake news coming across. What we need are more people like this audience who read newspapers and listen to the news and think for themselves and say, you know, that might not be true, uh, what I'm reading about here. <laughs> They have to accept the fact that, f that foreign powers are introducing information into the United States that is untrue. Most recently, there's what's called a troll farm. Uh, it is in St. Petersburg, and give you the address of it. And in there, there are thousands of Russians who are playing the game on Facebook, on the internet. The, the most recent one they did was to put inflammatory stuff about taking a knee. And they put, of course, we should all take a knee. I mean, the, and then they would, elaborate on the, you know, the, the social disorder, the reasons why one should take any, meant to inflame the veterans and those who are pro-military. And then they would put out inflammatory ones saying, how dare you even talk about taking an AI fought and died and bled and mad. So in other words, what they're trying to do is to sow dissension. Now it's not helped when our political leaders exacerbate that. When in fact, the President of the United States claims that things are fake news when they're not fake news. I mean, who do you believe if from the highest level of the United States of America, you have claims of false news going out that are not, that puts it back on all of you, all of us. We have to be our own judges. But one of the things I think the consequences of, of this is that I think people are not going to believe so readily things they hear, things they read, and they're gonna wonder about it. The cost of that is the lack of community, the lack of cohesion, the lack of believing. Um, a great American, uh, John Gardner, founded the, the White House Fellows Program, Common Cause. John O. Black and I were both part of that program. Um, one of the last public speeches he gave, he said, someone asked him about the future of the United States, what's your main concern? He said, my main concern is the loss of sense of community. Uh, that is perhaps the single most destructive force that we have to face. And it comes because exactly this. If you do not agree on the facts, how do you agree on an assessment of the facts? So uh, to answer your question, I cannot see, the United States would not be the United States if we solved that problem, which we would do by totalitarian means. So we're not gonna do it. But we are going to be far more reliant on who, what source comes. I think one of the most trusted sources PBS, the New York Times. I mean, even they get it wrong sometimes, but you know coming from them is probably far more reliable but than what you might get from a website or a blogger somewhere. And I think that's what we're gonna have to start doing. We're gonna have to start attaching credibility ratings to where we get our news. Right. Very good. Uh, the irony of uh, uh, the uh, uh, tension of create, trying to create community uh, the, the, the source of that being the internet that was designed to create communities. I don't know if the, that irony's lost on everybody or not, but uh, it yeah. seems very strange. I've got a couple other questions I really want to ask you, but I know 
uh, there may be folks in the audience that have, uh, have questions as well. So I, I'd like to transition, uh, seeing if there are any audience questions so we get some of these in. So why don't we start with, since I've had my back to you the whole time, uh, let, let's start with this gentleman right here. Yes, sir. Thank you. So there's been a lot of enthusiasm in the private sector about uh, the development of the Internet of Things, things like autonomous vehicles. Uh, at the same time, the threats have been growing. Do these threats kind of threaten the viability of these technologies and economic growth as a consequence? Why don't you start with that? Um, you've asked me a question about which I have rather strong feelings, and so I will not hold back. <laughs> the answer is you're damn you're, you're you're damned right it does. Now, one of the things that bothers me is the Internet of Things. Uh, there will be something like 22 billion platforms. They're growing exponentially every day. Every time you install something in your house, a, a garage door opener, something where you can see the kids home, home from school, a refrigerator that tells you you're low on orange juice, any one of those is an entry vehicle to get into to get into your security system. It is making us weaker. Now, when in Connecticut, we decided to come up with a cybersecurity strategy and action plan voluntarily. As chairman, I could have said, I'm gonna do this. Called, called a docket, brought in the lawyers, made a ruling and said, this is what we're gonna do. My decision, the other commissioner supported me, was we're much better off sitting down informally around a table and saying, what will work? What are you guys willing to come up? And they did. Who did? Water, electricity, and gas. I'll name the companies. Eversource, Avon Grid, Connecticut Water, and Aquarian. They all agreed there would be an annual inspection, of uh, discussion of their capabilities. They would use the model C2M2, cyber capability maturity model, and it's worked. Connecticut's out in front on this. The telecommunications, cable, and broadband industry refused to cooperate. Now, they are not regulated by either the federal government or the state governments, and they like that, right? But what bothers me to go right straight at your question, sir, is this. Those same companies have very sophisticated cybersecurity services. They will come in and sell it to you. They will tell you, <laughs> here, we, we have a great system. Would you like to buy it? It will make you cyber secure. And I say to them, you know, that's a very interesting system. Tell me about it. Oh, it does this, that. And I say, well, how about the spread of vulnerability because of the internet of things which you're producing? That's a different part of the company. And I said, look, you've got one CEO, you have one brand, you have one stock. If you were both settling, selling drugs on the street and running a rehabilitation center, somebody might say, make up your mind. <laughs> well, I say, make up your damn mind. Whose side are you on? <laughs> uh, thank you. Great question. Thanks a lot for that. Um, uh, let's go back here. Yes, sir. Thanks, Mr. House, and thanks for your service and your commitment to our country. Thank you. I want to say that very clearly. Um, I just have a quick question. Maybe you can help me understand. In conventional warfare, you know your enemy. You face him. You know the uniform. You know the you know the profiles of the tanks, and the you know who to go after. In this threat that you talk about, cyber force, which I'm not clear on. My first experience when I went to Kiev last year was a uh, dancing bear attack on our air, on our flight and and the government. And I thought about that and I said, well, who's the enemy, you know? Who's the foreign aggressor? In cybersecurity, there's this sense that there's this anonymity, right, this faceless person, sort of like what we saw with the, 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 uh, the soldiers in Crimea. Am I wrong to assume it's, it's a sovereign state? Is it a cultural troll? What are we looking at? Who is the enemy? Know thy enemy, who are they? And are they, is it some sort of new phenomenon in, in warfare that we need to be aware of? And I was hoping maybe you could help me understand. The enemy. You're, you're right, it's a very real problem. Um, in Ukraine, as you probably found out there, that they were losing a lot of tanks uh, with very precise artillery strikes coming from the Russians. And they're trying to figure out how these guys, this is unusual accuracy, what are they doing? Well, what the Russians did was they had filtered through, penetrated the cell phones of the artillery units. And when someone would call out saying, I've been out here three weeks, but they say I'm getting back next week. Bingo, that guy, they, 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 they sent the missile onto where that cell phone was and hit the tank. In my simplistic, there are nation states and rogue actors and attribution is difficult. I tried to sum up what you said in a more articulate fashion. Yeah, it's very difficult. Um, the Russians, for example, tolerate um, 
all kinds of mischievous private groups, uh, syndicated crime, they call them posses and so forth. The only ground rule is don't ever mess around with us. As long as you're causing trouble outside the country, that's fine. If we ever catch you messing around with our government, we'll fry you. And when they get into operations sometimes, they use these private groups. So that if you're subject to exactly what you talked about, where did it come from? Well, it came from a real estate company in Minsk. Who is it? Uh, what is it? And that's very difficult. Attribution is extremely difficult. If you know that it's either a nation state or a rogue actor, and if it's hiring me, it's not good, that's all you know for sure. Uh, sometimes you can push it through to attribution, sometimes you can't. But it does cause an awful lot of suspicion and certainly a gr much greater heightened sense of defense. And, and if I could add something Please, to that, Art. Uh, you know, we've highlighted one aspect of the problem, that is the attribution piece. But even when you do know, uh, because uh, outside of total war, uh, this is a very fuzzy domain in terms of how you act. On only in America can you um, have government officials make a decision uh, to authorize a 2,000 pound JDAM to be dropped on a person and then debate about whether or not uh, you can interfere with their ability to use the internet. Uh, so it's, a, it's an area that's very fuzzy, that's evolving, that, that we really haven't come to grips yet uh, with, you know, what is our, our policy, how are we going to implement it, what are the rules for the military and for non-military folks, when you, even when you get to attribution, which is a challenging piece uh, to do quickly as well. Uh, let, there's a question in back here. Let's Thank you. Thank you, General. Um, we have just seen what happens when we disrupt water, electricity, transportation, communications with Puerto Rico. Um, the concern here is, and I, I was the one who said cybersecurity last, last night was uh, our number one problem, is very simply we can lose electricity throughout the country or in a region, water, et cetera, et cetera. What have our uh, transportation, communication, and utility companies done in this country to deal with cybersecurity? Thank you. The questioner is Peter Kelly. He's a good, <laughs> he's a good friend of mine, led the World Affairs Council, uh, and continues to be a remarkable contributor to the good of Connecticut. Peter, um, the utility, start with the utilities. The utilities are focused on defense. Um, and how they can protect themselves. I could say this, they have made massive progress in the last five years since I've been working with them. Um, they have added personnel, they've added systems, they've added external consultants, they've done penetration testing. So they're much stronger at defending against it happening, one. Secondly, the United States realizes that this could happen, but you, you get at the point that I've perhaps over been banging on the head too much here, is that the emergency response of the United States rests in the hands of the states. That people say, this is a federal problem, the army will come in. Well, no, it won't. I mean, if this were, say, to hit the eastern part of the United States, no, this is the responsibility of the emergency management capacities uh, of the states. Who has the emergency authority to go to a diesel gas depot and say, we need to transport that diesel fuel to this hospital, the governor, by declaring emergency powers. And so that's why every single one of the states needs to understand the gravity of it, and secondly, to rehearse it, prepare it, just like we do for hurricanes. Now, I took that question down to some of my old colleagues in the intelligence community and said, when you look at Connecticut, what do you see happening? What, what, where, where are our vulnerable points? They said there's three of them, critical infrastructure, your defense industry, and financial services, insurance and, and, and banking. The first for every state is critical infrastructure. If Connecticut were hit, 50% of our electricity is generated by natural gas. The, the easiest thing to hit, and the most devastating with one strike, would be the Colonial Pipeline coming out of Philadelphia to New Jersey to New York, which would cut down our ability to refine uh, gasoline and, and diesel fuel, it would hit New York City, by the way, but it would also cut off half of the ability of New England to generate electricity. Where would it hit first? The purification of water. 
You can go, you can put on an extra blanket, you can get, find an extra can of soup, that sort of things. But when you cannot have drinking water, you will leave. And the scenario played out for the New England states, including Connecticut, is after three weeks, there would be an X migration of between six and 900,000 people. That you, if you can't drink, you go. The two things happen. You can't purify water, and sewage has to be dumped into the rivers because it can't be purified. It causes people to leave. So now, that's an answer to your question. I think people know that, but we haven't rehearsed it. We haven't planned that out. We haven't, we haven't said, okay, if this happens, where do they go and what do we do? So the obligation on the states to look at that reality, plan for it, and rehearse it is upon all of us. And unfortunately, I mean, I, I know we have about 10 more questions here. I've got dozens. Uh, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. So let me just say, uh, in conclusion, that uh, first of all, thank you all for your interest. Uh, I hope this has stimulated uh, some thinking about this subject, uh, number one. Uh, number two, uh, I hope it's been informative. Uh, number three, given the previous panel, and then this one, uh, for those of you that need therapy for your depression uh, out at the desk out here, uh, hopefully you can get some help and an appointment. But uh, thank you all very much for your interest, and, and thank you thank for you very much. Uh, thank you. discussion.